applicant for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Commissioner Heiberger. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you, Cindy. Uh, with that, we'll, uh, if anybody needs uh, help with a listening device, Robert can help them up front. Uh, meeting documents are next to Commissioner Kelly on the corner there. And please silence your cell phones if you haven't already done that. So thank you. With that, we'll jump into routine business. Item number one is consider a motion to approve the agenda. Motion so to moved. Approved. Second. Second. <laughs> we have two motions in pick. two seconds. <laughs> Take your pick. Take your pick is right. Anybody have any changes to the agenda? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the same. Motion unanimously passes. Item number two is to approve the County Commission minutes of November 26, 2013, and the joint minutes of November 26, 2013. I'll move both. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve both the regular and the joint meeting minutes. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item three are bills to be paid in the amount of $215,310.11. Pay the bills. Second. We have a motion and a second to pay the bills. Any comments, questions? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. There are no reports today. Item five is personnel actions. A is a motion to approve the routine personnel. Morning, Carrie. Good morning. Is there a motion to uh, pass routine action? So moved. Second. Motion and a second to uh, approve the routine action. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion unanimously passes. Item B is to recognize significant employees' anniversaries for December 2013. Good morning. I have four anniversaries for you this morning. Roger Stanzel and John Crittenden, both with the highway, celebrating 20 years of service, wanted to be here this morning, but unfortunately they were understandably detained. We'll see if we can't get them back for you next week. Um, we also have Barbara Janza, the senior records technician in the Registered Deeds Office. Barbara's here, and she's celebrating 15 years of service. So congratulations to her. And we also have Vicki Raker at the Public Defender's Office celebrating five years, and I don't believe she was able to attend today. But our thanks go out to all four of those individuals. Barb, thank you for your uh, service. You've been an outstanding employee, and uh, Julie's proud to be uh, part of your team, so to speak. It's a great combination of experience. It makes the county work so well, so thank you. Uh, Item C is to recognize volunteers and county government for November 2013. Carrie Deaver. Another big month, 223 volunteers throughout county. So as always, our thanks go out to them. It's a large group of people helping us out each month. Yep. It's an awesome group, very dedicated. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. There are no application for abatements today, no notices and requests no planning and zoning notices, and no petition for compromise of lien. The next item is an opportunity for public comment. Uh, now is the time for anyone who uh, would like to come forward and speak about any item that is not on the agenda. Mark? Uh, Chair Benning, uh, members of the Commission, my name is Mark Lee with the Sioux Falls Area Chamber of Commerce. As you know, the Chamber takes a vital interest in the uh, activities of its governmental units in, the, in and around Sioux Falls. And I'm pleased today to introduce a new member of our team. Uh, Mike Lynch has joined our team as of yesterday. And uh, Mike will be working with me in the public affairs area. So you will be seeing a lot of Mike. And I just wanted to get uh, a name to the face so that uh, you all recognize him and you know you have another resource at the chamber. Oh, yeah. so. thank you, Mark. Thank yeah. you. Mike, would you like to come forward and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you for the welcome. Uh, my name is Mike Lynch. I am uh, a recent um, resident to Sioux Falls. Uh, I was actually born here, but uh, moved to uh, the Colton Chester area at the age of three and lived there until uh, I graduated high school from Tri-Valley. 
I know. I thought <laughs> that same thing. But, uh, you were a Tri Valley person. Yeah. So, uh, have lived in Madison, rural Madison, for the last 18 years. Uh, I taught high school English and Spanish. And then uh, most recently, I worked at East River Electric Power Cooperative for five and a half years. Have done some marketing consulting here in Sioux Falls uh, for the last couple months, and uh, I'm just happy to be with the chamber. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here, and thank welcome you. to Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Uh, any other public comments? <clears throat> if not, we will have to move to item 11 since it's not 9:15. Item 11 is consider a motion to approve the 2014 Minnehaha County Liquor License Renewal Applications. And the Auditor's Office has received applications from the following uh, establishments, the Baltic Corner, Retail On Sale Liquor, Bottoms Up, Retail On Sale Liquor, Brex Bar and Grill, Retail On Sale Liquor, Dill's Rocky Run Golf Course, Retail On Sale Liquor, The Alibi, Retail On Sale Liquor, Monarch Steakhouse, Retail On Sale Liquor, Monarch Package Store, a package off-sale liquor license, the Red Rock Bar and Casino, Retail On Sale Liquor, River Ridge Golf Club, Retail On Sale Liquor, the Sioux Empire Fair Association, Retail On Sale Liquor, Wild Water West Water Park, Retail On and Off Sale Wine, Old 77 Bar and Grill, Retail On Sale Liquor, the Safari Bar and Grill, Retail On Sale Liquor, and the Riviera by, Riviera by Rocco's Retail On and Off Sale Wine License application. Uh, the State's Attorney's Office, Planning Department, and Sheriff's Offices have all reviewed the applications, and there are no objections or concerns that were reported. Today, um, we are requesting your approval of the 2014 uh, liquor license and wine license renewal applications. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, questions of Cindy. Yeah, have there been any uh, sting failures or... or uh any violations? No, there haven't. None? Nope, none. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Barth? Cindy, the only one that's uh, new, basically, is the Riviera by Rocco's, right? That's, that's correct. The only <clears throat> one. That's correct. Well, it's actually a renewal. It was just new in 2013. But this is a renewal for 2014. Okay. With that, is there any uh, comments or motions? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the uh, liquor license renewal applications. Any other questions, comments? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. Okay, we'll move on to item 12, which is to consider a motion to supplement $2,019.14 from the general fund to the planning budget. ASN 18264, Education and Training, representing reimbursement from South Dakota Building Officials Association to attend the National ICC Conference. Scott Anderson. Thank you. Uh, Scott Anderson representing the Planning Department. And uh, this is for training um, and uh, represents reimbursement for a scholarship. Our Chief Building Inspector, uh, Chief Building Official, received from the uh, South Dakota Building Officials. Uh, he attended the conference in September. They gave us our reimbursement uh, in end of October, and this is just sort of a bookkeeping, um, putting it back in the ASN for the that it came out of for the education and training. Um, they paid for everything except uh, his meals, which we uh, paid for for the few days that he was there. Thank you, Scott. Anyone have any questions for Scott? I'd make a motion to approve this supplement, Mr. Chairman. A motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the uh, supplement to the general fund. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion unanimously passes. Thank you. Item 13 is considered a motion to approve a resolution of sale for tax deed number 2556 and to authorize the county treasurer to issue a quick claim deed. Bob Letts. Good morning, Commission. Bob Blitz from the Auditor's Office. Uh, the annual tax deed sale was held on Saturday, November 23rd. Uh, I'd like to show you what uh, what we auctioned off here. Uh, tax deed number uh, tax deed number 2556 RDID 29189 was the only property advertised to be sold at the auction. 
the minimum bid was set at $15,000 and the property sold at $37,000. There were six registered bidders at the sale. There was another guy who got there a little bit late, but uh, so we had a total of seven people looking at it. Uh, considering there's only one property being auctioned off, we we're very pleased to have some competitive bidding. I'm requesting that you accept the highest bid of $37,000 and approve the resolution of sale. Thank you, Bob. Does anyone have any questions? Make a motion to approve uh, the resolution and authorize to issue a quick claim deed. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the uh, sale of the tax deed prod, prod, tax deed number 2556. Those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. Thank you, Commission. Thank you. Item number 14 is a briefing on the proposed Minnehaha County Highway Department Snow and Ice Removal Policy. DJ Boothy. Maybe we should have waited a month. We wouldn't have snow this morning. Yeah, right. Good morning, Commissioner. DJ Boothy, Highway Superintendent. Uh, the policy that was sent out in the briefing memo uh, was drafted uh, by Highway Department personnel uh, upon review of several different policies, similar policies from different agencies, and and uh, using those as kind of templates and then having a series of meetings with our, our staff that is in charge of uh, snow removal operations and, and also the staff that com completes the actual snow removal operations. Um, so kind of combining the, the history of how we've done things in the past uh, with some of the guidelines that other agencies are are uh, using to complete their snow removal operations. <clears throat> it was our intent to provide a snow and ice removal policy as a direction uh, both to our employees and our staff and also as, as uh, information to the public uh, so they understand what our intent is and what our expectations are for snow removal. Um, it's not an all-inclusive policy because um, weather is very unpredictable and, and changes all the time. Uh, just speaking this morning with Cindy before the meeting started, uh, we normally would have been in at 5 o'clock on a day like today uh, to get ahead of uh, traffic and the storm and things like that. Um, tonight, or This morning we, we didn't come in at 5 because uh, things weren't supposed to start as early as they did. And so um, that's just uh, an example of how things can change and, and so a, a policy like this can't necessarily be black and white that says we will do certain things because uh, things change and, and we gotta adjust. And so uh, the policy as it's drafted right now was sent out. Um, the policy does not define a level of service, uh, again because weather is so unpredictable. Um, uh, however, it, in, it provides what our intent is and our intent is to prov provide reasonable ice control uh, while taking into consideration the availability of labor, equipment, and funding. Um, the city of Sioux Falls on, on a major storm event uh, can easily spend several hundred thousand dollars, and that's because they're out there doing 24-hour 24 24 hour operations uh, during the storm event, and then after the storm event to pick up snow from behind the curb. Uh, our department, I, doubt has ever spent several hundred thousand dollars on on a single event uh, just because we're running our routes uh, during the storm event and then any kind of ice cleanup afterwards uh, but we don't have to continue going back and picking up snow we just put it in the ditch uh, during some winter seasons uh, when there is so much snow that it is piled up in the ditch uh, very high almost like a tunnel we do go back and do more maintenance uh, to try to cl uh, keep the roadway clear, um, but we certainly don't do that on a regular basis. Um, I'll go through, I, I think, some of the, the highlights of what our policy says, and then if you guys have any questions either during that or, or afterwards, uh, feel free to ask those questions, but I'm not going to read through the entire policy as it is three pages long. Um, like I had indicated before, this policy is is sort of a guideline. Um, a departure from this policy it says may be necessary to protect the safety, health, and welfare of the traveling public. Uh, it is, again, not our intent to have a black and white policy. If our crew needs to do something uh, out of the ordinary, let's say, uh, to help somebody that, uh, that is in danger, we're certainly going to do that, not, not avoid 
helping somebody because our policy says we can't. Uh, one of the things that our policy covers is operation hours. Uh, just informative saying that our normal winter working hours <coughs> are Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 4. And uh, during typical uh, winter weather, uh, we do have snow removal operations occurring during the hours of 5 a.m. and dusk. We have exceptions to that uh, for emergencies, and we will certainly respond to emergency uh, fire health uh, or, or fire medical or police uh, emergency response uh, any time of the day. Uh, operations in adverse conditions. Equipment will not be dispatched uh, in low visibility or conditions such that the risk of the operators or other motorists outweighs the benefits. An example of that would be uh, during a blizzard, uh, especially um, towards the end of the day when, or the very beginning of the day when visibility might be very low. If, if we can't see uh, what we're trying to plow, uh, then, then uh, it's very risky for us and it could very easily um, result in and injury to somebody that might be stalled out on the road if we're out driving around in plows and not able to see. And so um, uh, we, we will limit operations in, in some adverse conditions. What we consider adverse conditions might be a little different than what uh, uh, the normal traveling public might consider adverse conditions. Uh, we certainly hope that some people are staying at home uh, while we go operate and do our normal snow removal op operations. Uh, so we wouldn't consider a normal st storm event adverse conditions uh, for, for our snow removal equipment. Uh, route priorities, uh, because of the level of staffing that we provide, we have to prioritize what, uh, what we're doing. Uh, and we've <coughs> identified four different priorities uh, for our, our uh, snow removal operations. Uh, the first being major collector routes. Uh, these are uh, county major collector roads and, and primary commuter routes. And uh, because of the staffing that we do have, uh, we do have 20 snow removal routes uh, currently. And we're able to do snow removal on both our major collector routes and our minor collector routes somewhat simultaneously. Uh, and so the minor collector routes are um, the remaining paved county roads that are not uh, collector routes. And, and like I said, typically uh, we're able to send people out to both the major and the minor collector routes at the same time. It's because of staffing, uh, uh, PTO and things like that are a sickness. If, if we aren't able to st uh, staff all of our snow removal routes, uh, we will prioritize major collector routes before we do the minor collector routes. <coughs> and then after we're uh, completed working on our, our uh, county paved roads, uh, we will do uh, other county government buildings as requested as long as we have the availability of equipment and, and manpower. Examples of that would be the courthouse, the administration building, uh, JDC, uh, other buildings that, that the county uh, owns or county property. Uh, right now, uh, because of the way that uh, our equipment is set up, uh, we are able to uh, mobilize for the courthouse uh, at basically at the same time as we're mobilizing for our uh, county paved roads because we're not sending a plow truck down here, we're sending a pickup that has a smaller sander on it. And so basically after the uh, county's contractor comes and completes snow removal at the county, uh, we're able to send our guys over and, and help with uh, salting some of the parking lots. And then the fourth priority uh, for the route priorities would be local roads. Uh, these roads are typically township roads, but they can also be uh, municipalities or private roads. Uh, we do not make a practice of going to local roads. In fact, I, um, by statute, we should not be doing these roads. However, if there's emergency situations, again, we will de deviate from any kind of policy stuff that's written on paper in order to provide emergency assistance. And so uh, an example would be, um, I think three or four years ago now we had a lot of snow and our guys tell me that uh, they were going helping clear out uh, some of the smaller municipality roadways in order to just get uh, fire service to certain, um, certain roads. 
her equipment is a lot uh, bigger and and has better capabilities than some of the townships. A lot of the townships just use their motor graders for their snow removal. Uh, moving on, level of service. Uh, like I said, we, we don't necessarily define a, a level of service with this, but we do talk about level of service. <coughs> uh, we don't have a bare pavement policy, and, and we state that our roads may not be free of snow and ice. <coughs> kind of, I wouldn't call it a liability waiver by any means, uh, but just stating that, um, especially like in the city of Sioux Falls, um, you can pretty well depend on, on having bare pavement for the majority of their snow events. And, and just because of finances and, and manpower and, and uh, practicality, uh, we don't pursue a bare pavement policy. Um, the city, I've been told their goal is to have uh, white residual calcium chloride on their roads uh, after the snow event is over and before any other snow event. And, and it, it just simply wouldn't be cost effective for us to do that on our roads. Um, we do have some considerations uh, for general snow and ice removal. Uh, Anti-icing, snow removal, and ice removal may be limited to daylight hours. Uh, that's something that like the school districts and, and traveling public should expect. Uh, we don't do our, our normal operations during the nighttime. Uh, depending upon current and forecasted weather conditions, snow and ice uh, will be removed as best as practical. Uh, and basically what that means is, is we're not going to spend all day on, on one road if, if we can't get the ice off. We'll do the best that we can and then we'll move on to other roadways. Uh, special consideration may be given uh, to critical intersections, hills, curves, and other hazardous areas. And um, if, if all 347 miles of our pavement was uh, covered in ice, we, we simply couldn't cover that whole 347 miles in a day. And so what our guys will do is they'll go out to critical areas like the stop signs and the intersections and where there's hills where we know there's trouble spots. And we'll hit, hit those trouble spots first uh, to try to take care of any major incidents, incidents that would happen. Uh, because of an event, and then we'll go back after that and try to clean up uh, the rest of the roadways. Uh, rural mailboxes, the next section there, is something that is an interesting discussion uh, when the highway superintendents get together. Um, the, the argument of some counties is that they don't care um, if snow knocked down a mailbox or if their plows hit a mailbox that just means that the property owner had their mailbox too close to the road and they won't fix them. Uh, what our standard practice has been in the county and which and, and what I would like to pursue in the future is that if if we uh, negatively impact the structure of a mailbox or if we knock it down either because we hit it physically with our equipment or if we go by too fast as we're plowing and the snow knocks it over or, or breaks it or dents it or something like that uh, that we go and we replace it with a new mailbox, um, a new post, and and we take care of that for the property owners. Uh, we can go through either any, anywhere from 15 to, to 45 or so mailboxes in a year, and they're relatively inexpensive for us to fix. If we spend a thousand or two thousand dollars on mailboxes uh, in a in a winter season, uh, the property owners that had their mailboxes hit are going to. Um, feel a lot better had we just said you had your mailbox too close to the roadway and I'm sorry. Uh, and that's a pretty cheap uh, insurance policy to keep the public happy. And, and we certainly don't want to get into any arguments on whose fault it might have been uh, because we do have pretty big equipment that goes by uh, by the small little mailboxes. So um, I think that we should just continue to keep replacing the mailboxes. And, and it says in this paragraph here how we go about doing that and, and what the time frame might be. Uh, the next section, obstructions. Um, there are some obstructions that uh, tend to be left in the right-of-way at times. And, and in the winter season when obstructions are left in the right-of-way, uh, that can cause a significant amount of drifting uh, on the road, which uh, creates trouble spots for us. Uh, ice is more likely to form uh, when there's drifting on the roadway. And so a big one is hay bales. If farmers uh, stack their hay bales along the right-of-way line or uh, we allow them to um, hay the ditch and then they leave the hay bales there. Um, 
that can cause problems for us. Uh, also, if, if uh, vehicles are uh, left either in the roadway if they break down or alongside of the roadway if they break down or if they pull into a, a driveway <coughs> or a field approach, uh, if they're broken down or if they're lost or anything like that, uh, this addresses how uh, the county may remove the hay bales uh, after November 1st in order to prepare for the winter season. Um, and that's, that's typical throughout the state. Uh, the state DOT does something similar and, and several counties do that too. Uh, it says that the county will not be liable for damage of stalled or st stranded vehicles on a traveled portion of the roadway uh, or other obstructions which will interfere with snow and ice removal. Um, what we typically do if there's a stranded vehicle that, that is not occupied is uh, we'll call 911 or the sheriff's office and arrange for that vehicle to be towed. Um, on private roads, uh, this was covered a little bit earlier uh, when, I, when I talked about uh, local roads, but private roads are, are uh, developments where uh, the roadway is not, or the right-of-way is not owned by any uh, government entity. It's a private roadway. Um, we will not operate or any snow removal equipment on private roads. An exception to this policy is, again, for law enforcement or medical response teams. Of course, if there's an emergency and we're directed by law enforcement uh, or some medical staff, uh, we'll do anything that we can to open up a roadway. <coughs> the last section of the policy is uh, snow placed on the roadway. Um, a lot of times we have landowners uh, that will take their um, their tractor or whatever kind of equipment that they have and and they'll clear their driveway by uh, plowing down their driveway and then continuing straight across the highway and, and putting their snow in the ditch on the opposite side of the roadway and uh, any snow that's dumped or plowed or pushed across the roadway typically leaves a little bit of snow on the roadway uh, which can create a pretty serious hazard for uh, both the traveling public and also um, our own snow removal equipment. Uh, in addition, <coughs> their operation going back and forth uh, cr can create a hazard if there's traffic on that roadway as they're uh, trying to cross it with their snow removal equipment. And so um, we're going to be working with uh, Ken and Kirsten um, to draft some sort of ordinance that um, allows the highway department, once the property owners have been notified, if they continue to not um, remove that snow within a reasonable time, uh, the highway department can uh, mobilize and, and uh, remove the snow and, and uh, ordinance would state that that property owner can be built. And I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, Kirsten, uh, that's allowed right now by state law, but we would have to actually take them to court prior to having them being built. I think that's how I understood that. If I, if I may, yeah, right right now it's a general obstruction statute that, that actually defines it, um, you know, as a class one misdemeanor um, that would require criminal prosecution with that burden be sustained. Um, I've talked to DJ and I think you can uh, enact an ordinance uh, authorizing the highway department to to clear whatever obstructions at issue and charge the property owner, but I believe you do need to enact an ordinance to have that remedy available to you. You can consider that at an upcoming meeting once something is drafted, but you would have to pass something, in my opinion, to recover under that method. Okay. It's some, something similar to what we do occasionally uh, when there's an accident that uh, damages a, a bridge railing, for example. Um, we go and we make the repairs to the railing, obviously, and then we build the insurance company of the at fault vehicle, and just to try to recover some of our expenses. Well, uh, similarly, when a landowner is uh, essentially breaking the law by leaving snow on the roadway during their snow removal of their private property, uh, we want to be able to recover some of our expenses for having to go back. And I think naturally, landowners will catch on to this and and refrain from doing that in the future if that happens. So that's a, a quick summary, I think, of, of the uh, proposed policy. I'd be interested to hear any comments or questions that any of you have. 
Thank you, DJ. Uh, any questions for DJ, Commissioner I just Barth? Have a question for Kirsten. Sorry. Go Jeff, first. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Um, DJ, um, when we go through a small town on the county highway, do we lift the blade, like going through Baltic on Lovely Avenue? Do yes we, and no. Um, in the past, we never did lift the blade, and it, it it would maybe vary between municipalities because some are bigger than others. For example, Brandon, yeah. uh, we lift. Um, a lot of times, uh, the edge of a municipality is a turnaround point, <clears throat> and so if we do go into the municipality uh, to go to a turnaround, we'll keep our plows down. Um, if if um, we have to actually go all the way through, similar to like, uh, um, I don't think we go through Baltic, but if we went through um, crooks, uh, crooks, yeah. crooks uh, we've told our guys that they can leave their blades down. We, we typically don't uh, drop chemical or salt uh, in those areas because they have their own practices, uh, but as far as keeping the plow down, we're, we're okay with that. Commissioner Heiberger? I was just going to ask, <clears throat> excuse me, Kirsten, if you had reviewed it and if you had any concerns. I have, I have no concerns. I've reviewed it already, and, and besides those additional remedies needing mm -hmm. to be passed by ordinance, I don't have any other legal concerns okay. with it. Commissioner Barr. One other thing, I guess, on those mailboxes, uh, uh, they're all supposed to be breakaway these days, isn't that right? So those ones that are out there with the brick uh, outhouse attached to them, uh, <laughs> those aren't quite kosher. <coughs> that's correct, and that's another item that... Um, you'll be considering in the future uh, as a commission uh, through our signing program. Um, we're obviously not going to knock down a, a brick mailbox with a little bit of snow unless one of our guys hits it with a wing or something like that. I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, but through the signing program, uh, there is a requirement uh, that has actually been lifted because of other counties having problems with the requirement, but uh, we're still considering complying with the requirement. Uh, the um, FHWA, uh, Federal Highway Administration, has standards on breakaway uh, devices within the clear zone of the travel uh, right-of-way. And um, the majority, probably all of those brick mailboxes, uh, don't, make, uh, don't meet the breakaway standard. And so through the signing program, and there any obstruction within the right-of-way that's not breakaway uh, shall be removed and replaced with breakaway structures. So that means that any really nice mailbox created out of brick needs to be removed and replaced with the breakaway mailbox. Um, a lot of counties were having political problems with doing that and so uh, the DOT removed that requirement from the signing program uh, but we feel that uh, that rule and guideline is there for a reason and it's our duty to follow it. Um, it's my duty by state law to follow our rules and guidelines. Uh, but we are going to give the commission the option of, of uh, pursuing the removal of those. Uh, I, I don't think there's a lot in the county. I would say probably 10 or less. I just so. don't want to have to replace any of those it's, uh, with like. Right. We're, we're certainly not going to replace them with like because mm -hmm. that would be illegal. <laughs> yeah. they, they can have them along their property line, but I don't think the, the post office would be very happy about no. that. Other questions? Thank you, DJ. Uh, this is a briefing. If there's anyone from the public who would like to make comments, we would listen to those now. Otherwise, we will uh, uh, have this again next week, I believe, on the 10th for adoption. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go back to item number 10, which is a hearing to consider drainage permit number 13-71, application submitted by Greg and Karen Schultz to conduct agricultural drainage on the south half northwest quarter of section 15, township 102 north, range 52 west in Humboldt Township. Scott Anderson. Yes, thank you. Um, Scott Anderson representing the planning department. And today we're having a hearing on a drainage application 13-71. Uh, this is a, a request that was brought in uh, that was submitted by Greg and Karen Schultz and was brought in by um, Steve Becker to do some drainage work, a uh, drainage project in Section 15 of Humboldt Township. This is properties located basically at the southeast corner of Humboldt, and I have a little map here that we'll look at. 
Um, the, uh, you can see the city of Humboldt, uh, the city limits, and then this shows the approximate uh, area that the applicant would like to um, tile. Uh, a notice of this hearing was sent out on December 3rd to all the downstream property owners within one half mile of the outlet of the proposed drainage project. There were three property owners. Uh, the water will flow under an existing driveway that's owned by Steve Elias, uh, and then it will cross land owned by uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife into Beaver Lake, which you can see um, uh, at the edge of the uh, screen of encompasses in the circle. Um, all the property owners signed it, but not U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They did send a letter indicating that they would not attend the meeting today. Um, so. I don't want anyone to think that it was a snow or ice that caused them not to make it today. They had no intention of showing up. Um, I did make a staff visit on the 20th um, and took some pictures for you and I'll show those to you now. The tile line outlets are being placed in areas that uh, are typically wet and we can go back. You, if you look at, if we compare these two slides, you easily can see the area that, uh, that where they would like to do the work sort of follows uh, an area that is uh, wet. Uh, where the tile outlet comes out, you'll notice there's probably a 40 to 60 foot drop that uh, it comes down and then goes into um, Beaver Lake. So there is very, very good drainage there once it gets past the uh, Elias' driveway. So we'll go over the pictures now for you. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Once again, this is what they're proposing. Uh, this is standing on, on the road, which is uh, 467th Avenue, and I'm looking uh, southeast. Up in the very corner on the horizon, you can see the, uh, the, Eli the Elias' house and barn. Um, this is, once again, now this is looking basically east-northeast along that existing drainage way. Where the, where the grass is located is where they'd like to put the, the tile. This once again shows the, the uh, property. Now I'm sort of looking northwest back towards uh, Humboldt. Uh, this, you can see the Elias' driveway. This is between their, two, their house and their egg barn structure. Uh, Mr. Becker indicated to me that when they built this house, recently built this house, they installed uh, a, a piece of, of tile underneath the driveway so it will not disturb or have to, their driveway won't have to be torn up. This is basically standing at the outlet of that property looking southeast. You can see the lake and the nice ravine drop off as it goes towards the lake. And once again, uh, you can see the, uh, the lake. And um, it, this shows you sort of the elevation. There's the, the County Durango. You can see that the, it's parked on the driveway. The um, proposed drainage would outlet uh, where that culvert is and flow down this ravine and into um, Beaver Lake. And I'll uh, go back to the um, go back to the uh, this. Um, it's staff's findings that the proposed maintenance and the tile lines will be placed in traditionally wet areas that function as part of the same watershed and we are recommending, uh, staff recommends to the drainage <coughs> board that you approve the drainage permit 1371. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have and I know that Mr. Becker's here if you'd like to ask him any questions. Thank you, Scott. Does anyone have any questions for Scott? Uh, would the applicant like to make any comments? And you do need to identify yourself. My name is Steve Becker. 45809 Highway 38, Humboldt. Um, I've been farming this property for about 20 years. And where we're going to put this tile, there is old existing tile that's been verified by the NRCS. Also, the, there's a ditch that runs from the west to the east, and it discharges into the tile inlet, the old one. So all this property had been drained at one time, but the, the tile no longer functions and hasn't since I farmed it. And it's just a matter of replacing and improving what was originally there. So. Thank you, Steve. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Becker? Commissioner Barth? 
Um, Steve, uh, do you have any of your land that's currently flooded by that lake then? At yeah, yes, about 45 acres. Okay, and uh, that's been for a couple of years now, right? It's been for several years, yes. Okay. Um, those grass waterways, are you going to do away with them with this? Yes. The one, the one that uh, starts at the west road and goes east, that one will be done away with. There is a grass waterway from the outlet, goes north probably 100 yards. That one will not. It's too deep. But, I mean, it's not something you want to fill in. It's an existing ditch, and I won't. I'm not. I don't plan on cleaning it. It's a grass waterway, kind of filters any excess when you get real heavy rainfall. Mr. Chair, one more sure. question. Sure. Steve, it seems to me I saw where when they built the new school in Humboldt that on the southeast part of the city, they had water problems too with drainage. Does that affect your land there? Not so much what they did with the school, but when they added on to the north side of the cemetery. They redirected some water that normally didn't get out of the property and they yeah. routed it around the cemetery and that comes in on the west side of my property. Did they property. ever ask you about no. dumping water on your land? No, they didn't. Uh, I questioned them and they said, well, who would complain? It's for the church. I said, well, <laughs> not everybody belongs to this congregation. So. Yeah. Yeah. No complaints from the people in the cemetery. Yeah, no. Any other questions for Mr. Becker? Uh, Scott, can you uh, clarify something for us? Uh, obviously, Mr. Becker is the owner, but the applicants from Greg and Karen Schultz. Uh, they signed the application, and Mr. Becker is uh, serving as basically their representative. But okay. they, Mr. and Mrs. Schultz did sign the um, application, and that's what's required. So. It's not unusual where the tenant sometimes uh, sort of handles these things for the owner. Okay. Just making sure we do it the right way. Any other questions? Actually, if cool. I may. Kirsten. A brief one for Scott. Um, you mentioned the Fish and Wildlife Service isn't attending. Did they articulate any reason why they wouldn't sign the downstream waiver? Uh, it's just typically not their policy to uh, promote anything but natural drainage. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve drainage permit 13-71. Anyone like to make any comments from the audience? If not, we have a motion and a second to approve. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Good luck. Now we'll move on to item 15, which is consider a motion to approve resolution to restore legal load limits on certain bridges in Minnehaha County. DJ Boothy. Good morning, Commissioners. DJ Boothy again, Highway Superintendent. Uh, with the construction season wrapping up, uh, we've uh, completed three additional uh, bridge construction projects uh, that had previously posted uh, load limits. Uh, via ordinance and so it's our intent today to uh, pass a resolution uh, to remove those uh, legal or lo those load limits and restore legal loads on those structures the three structures in question are the Ellis Bridge uh, which is about a half a mile south of Ellis on Highway 138 and then the two 121 bridges um, just uh, north of Eros on the Eros Road Thank you, DJ. Uh, anyone have any questions? If not, does anyone have a motion? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the uh, legal load limits on the uh, uh, structures that are listed. Those in favor say uh, aye. Can I just make aye? <laughs> Did you have a question? No, we can do it after the vote. Okay. Let's make sure I got the vote. Um, we do have a motion and a second to approve. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Commissioner Kelly, you have a comment? I'd just like to compliment the Highway Department for what they've gotten done with bri bridges in the last two years, and, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly that Baltic, uh, that Bal those one, 121, because you couldn't even drive your car over those previously. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. I think people up here uh, 
feel very confident with your plan and your ability to get our bridges back to uh, reasonable condition and the long range plan is uh, well documented and we appreciate your uh, management of that. Thank you. Yep. Uh, next item. Item 16 is consider adoption of Minnehaha County Graphic Standards Manual and letterhead templates. Briefing was on November 26th. Carol Muller. Good morning, Commissioners. Carol Muller, Human Services. Last week, um, Ken McFarland briefed you guys on the changes with the logo and the seal and um, just going over the graphic standards that are out there, which creates a uniform, uniform identity for the county. And um, I guess I would answer any questions that you have. I believe that you all have a copy of what we've gotten. We have it set up so that we're ready to go with the electronic templates for everybody. Everything's pretty much ready to go with the printers that's out there. We appreciate the support from IT because they got, you know, the devils in the details and they kind of got some of those dropped on them. But I think we're ready to go. Thank you, Carol. Questions, so the, Commissioner the compatibility Kelly? between Apple and... Uh, yeah, we got that worked out. Okay. I guess I'm speaking for Monty, but I believe we got everything worked out. He's shaking his head yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Is there a motion to move to approve? Second, Sam. We have a motion and a second to approve the graphic standards and the letterhead. Those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. Motion passes. Thank you for your Thank work. You. Good job, Carol. Item 17 is to authorize the chairman to sign the Fusion Center lease agreement between First Dakota National Bank and Minnehaha County. Lynn DeYoung. Uh, Commissioners, Lynn DeYoung, Emergency Management. Uh, included in your packets a copy of the lease. Uh, this is basically just a renewal um, with uh, First Dakota National Bank uh, for a five-year period. And I'd be willing to answer any questions that you have regarding this item. Thank you, Lynn. Anyone have any questions about renewing the lease? If not, is there a motion? Move, Move. to approve. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to approve the Fusion Center lease. Those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion unanimously passed. Thank you. <coughs> Item 18 is consider a motion to transfer $5,000 from the Commissioner's Contingency Fund to the Commission Office Budget ASN 15094 Community Projects for the Sioux Falls Tomorrow 3 Project. Robert Wilson. Good morning, Commissioners. Robert Wilson with the Commission Office. Um, on uh, October, excuse me, November 5th, the uh, Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation was here and uh, made a request for you to sponsor Sioux Falls 3 uh, planning project in the amount of uh, $5,000. Uh, and at that time, they, they indicated that other financial sponsors and partners that they would approach would be the uh, Sioux Empire United Way, Sioux Falls Area Chamber of Commerce, the City of Sioux Falls, and the Sioux Falls School District along with Lincoln County. Uh, at, that, at that time, uh, you indicated that you uh, indeed wish to support that endeavor in the amount of $5,000 coming out of the uh, Commissioner's Contingency Fund. And uh, following up on that, we're just, excuse me, coming back with a uh, uh, motion to uh, formally transfer that $5,000 from the uh, Commissioner's Contingency fund, fund into the Commission Budget ASN 15094 Community Support um, from which we would uh, um, cut the check and, and send that on and, and formally provide that support that you had, had previously indicated that you, uh, that you wanted to provide. Thank you, Robert. Any comments? If not, uh, I'd like a motion. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the transfer to the uh, Sioux Falls Tomorrow 3 project. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion passes 4 to 1. Item number 19 is consider adoption of county vehicle maintenance, replacement, and transfer policy. The briefing was on November 26, 2013. Robert Wilson. Commissioners, again, Robert Wilson of the Commission Office. And uh, again, last week, Ken briefed you on this, uh, this policy and the work that, that's gone into developing this over the last couple of months. Uh, really, all um, departments that use a, a pool fleet of vehicles, in, in some sense, uh, formed this committee to take a look at a uh, vehicle maintenance replacement and transfer policy at, at the direction of the Commission. And we've attached that uh, policy here in the uh, 
form that it came out of the, uh, the deliberations and the work of that committee. And the, uh, some of the highlights of that policy is that um, looked at a um, recommendation that departments would consider replacing sedans, light vans, light trucks, and SUVs at either uh, eight years of age or 150,000 miles of, of use. Uh, that was a, um, that uh, age and, and mileage changed uh, in, in response to some concerns and some dialogues that originally uh, a lower uh, mileage limit and a, uh, a shorter time frame would be um, maybe a little impractical for a number of the vehicles that we do use and, and uh, continue to um, get good service out of uh, in a number of our departments. So that was well, a discussion point among the committee. Another one is that the, um, um, the policy would include a, uh, a form that departments would uh, complete and submit at budget time uh, if they are considering replacement or purchase of a vehicle during the uh, coming budget year. That, a copy of that uh, form is also uh, attached to policy and again would be completed and submitted at budget time for any department that was uh, anticipating vehicle purchases in the following budget year. And the, uh, the, the final main point of, of this uh, or main highlight of the proposal or the um, policy would be that any transfer uh, of vehicles between policies, uh, between departments um, would, would provide a process for that uh, transfer both um, for the uh, uh, transferring the title as, as well as an accounting transfer before, between departments. And uh, this um, policy would, uh, proposal uh, as, as currently uh, drafted would uh, take effect on January 1st of uh, 2014. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Robert. Do anyone have any questions? I will say that I was on that committee and and I uh, strongly encourage the rewriting of this policy and, and prioritizing the vehicle purchases because I think with limited resources uh, we need to prioritize by uh, age and mileage and uh, not who has the most gifted conversation of uh, needing vehicles. So I think this is a black and white way for us to address that and it adopts uh, policy that will help us in the long run, long range to be able to uh, keep up with what we need to keep up with. So, Commissioner Kelly? Um, it, if I recall, we've been working on this about nine months, which means that getting something through the county is like birthing a baby. <laughs> <laughs> if we went by age and mileage, only John and Cindy would be here. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> I was going to say something about the... Uh, They're leaking out. <laughs> yeah. The uh, damage that you have on the back of your head this morning from yeah. falling down. So uh, <laughs> just don't let it go to the Republic. Um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Barth has uh, some staples back there that uh, are, look very painful from a, an accident. So we're glad that you're here, though. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Uh, any other comments besides Jeff's head? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, just to point out, on the policy, it is just a policy, and you know there are some vehicles out there that could be at less than 150,000 miles or maybe pushing eight years, and I think at any one of those circumstances, we're going to take it on a, on, it's a commission action. We're going to make the decision, but um, routinely at budget time, I can imagine that we're going to be hearing, well, you know, we're at eight years now, so we got to get rid of these and we got to add five new cars to our budget. You know, the reality is that it's ultimately this commission's decision, and it's just a policy. That's the way I view it. Com Commissioner Peckus, and I would point out that it, it is uh, worded as a uh, uh, recommends consider replacement at those, right. at those benchmarks. Right. right. If, uh, how many cars are out of compliance? If, if you say compliance, it's not the right word, but. I, I know we ran this early part of the year, and at, at that point we were doing a, a standard of, of 100,000 miles rather than, than 150,000. I don't have that, that information at the tip of my fingers. I could get that for you. 
I do know we have one Ford pickup that has 980 some thousand miles on it. But we can't find it. No. <laughs> yeah, it's parked over at the museum. It's on the <laughs> 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 flyer champion. I think we've lost control. Um, uh, we have a motion, I believe. No, we don't. We don't? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the policy as written. Anyone have any other comments? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion unanimously passes. We'll go to the liaison reports. Does anyone have any liaison reports at this point? Commissioner Barth? We have a couple of vacancies on the museum board of people who are term limited, and I have reviewed some applicants for that, and uh, we'll bring that to the commission later. Super. Any other liaison reports? If not, new business? Old business? If not, we do need to go into executive session for personnel, contract negotiations, and litigation. That's my motion, sir. All right, I'll second it. We have a motion and a second to go into exec session for those three items. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. I'll be back here at 10 o'clock.